Hello, everybody. I'm Natalie Brunel. Thank you so much for checking out my show where I get to hear from the leading voices in Bitcoin, financial markets, political structures, philosophy, and more. Please make sure you're subscribed to the show. And if you're watching this on YouTube, like this video so more people see it and hit that notifications button so you don't miss out on any new content. This podcast does not provide financial advice. It is for educational and entertainment purposes only. So make sure you always do your own research before making any financial decisions and be aware of your risk tolerance. I'm able to produce this show thanks to my sponsors, and I'm very picky about who I choose to partner with. So I hope you'll take the time to listen to the ad reads throughout the show. These are companies that I really believe in in the space. I've hand-selected them, and I actually use their products and services. I'm also able to produce this show thanks to the support of my listeners and viewers, Value for Value. So if you'd like to make a donation to help the show grow, you can find my Bitcoin and Lightning wallets in the description. All right, now to my main partner, Swan Bitcoin. Swan is where I do all of my Bitcoin purchases. In fact, I dollar cost average every single day, not every week, not bi-monthly, every single day. And they have the lowest fees in the space. I love Swan Bitcoin because it is a true Bitcoin only company. Swan has a ton of free educational resources on their website, and they now have a mobile app, which I've been using to smash by some Bitcoin. And Swan Studios produces my new show, Hard Money, which covers the biggest news in Bitcoin and the global economy. It's like an orange-pilled version of CNBC, so make sure to check that out on YouTube for all the biggest headlines because we are not afraid to question the mainstream narrative. And Swan Bitcoin is putting on the first and biggest West Coast Bitcoin-only conference, Pacific Bitcoin. It'll be held November 10th and 11th in the LA area with prominent speakers like Michael Saylor, Lynn Alden, and Preston Pish. I'll be an MC, and also I'll be hosting some fireside chats with people like Jeff Booth and Alex Epstein. And if you want to come to the event, you still have time to get tickets. You can get 20% off at PacificBitcoin.com using the code HODL, H-O-D-L. Super excited to see you there. It's time for the show. Hi, Jim. It's so nice to have you on Coin Stories, and it was nice to meet you in person very briefly on the Charles Payne Show. Yeah, so it was, it was very nice to meet you too, and thanks for having me. Well, I want to start um, learning a little bit about your, your backstory and how you built your career, because I was reading your biography. Very, very interesting. I know you have a lot of experience with investing and fixed income, um, but are you from Chicago? Yes, I am. I, I grew up in... Uh... Hinsdale, Illinois. And, uh, you know, so I'm uh, a Chicagoan true and true. I've lived here for most of my life. I did leave Chicago for about six years when I lived in New York City right after graduation from college. And so growing up, did you always know that you wanted to work in the world of investing and finance? Is there something from your upbringing that made you go in that direction? I had relatives that worked on the Chicago Board of Trade. So I was familiar with what was going on. And I um, really just, you know, took classes on it. I got my undergrad degree in finance and I really enjoyed the whole idea about investing. Now, you got to remember for me, you know, taking college, going college classes and stuff like that. They, we're going back to late 70s, early 80s, uh, even before the great bull market started in 82. And I got really interested in the markets, um, you know, kind of in the early 80s, right around the start. Uh, of the great bull market, we, you know, essentially before the crash of 87. So I've been really interested more in the macro space than anything else. Uh, and I, I like to joke, you know, um, uh, I, I famous, I famous, not famously, but at one time in the early or in the late 90s, I did an interview on CNBC and the correspondent, this is how back, far back this goes, the correspondent was Jim Cramer. And he interviewed uh, me and he started yelling at me on the interview. Come on, Jim, I need symbols. What stocks do we buy? I mean, we just can't tell people the market's going to go up. And I was like, okay. Uh, but now fast forward, you know, a couple of years later, we've got thousands and thousands of ETFs. So any macro idea you have, there is a, there is a, there is an instrument to express it. We're back when I was interested in macro, you had to kind of force this into Okay, so you think this and this, so that means I got to buy Pfizer and I got to buy Exxon, right? And I was like, well, not really, but now, now you know there is just you know you can buy the energy stocks through XLE or you can buy the XLH, which is the healthcare stocks or something like that. It makes it a lot easier for a macro person. 
Well, a lot of people are comparing this current period to the 70s and 80s. So can you offer a little bit of perspective on that and the evolution you've seen throughout your career? Yeah, I don't quite think it's the 70s or 80s. Uh, you know, the 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 joke I like to say, people go, oh, shoo, okay, good. It's not the high inflation point of the 70s or 80s. No, it's the late 40s when we had an even higher inflation level. The highest inflation level that the U.S. had in the 20th century was in 1947 at 20%. We got the 14% in 1980. And the reason I say that it's more like the 40s is I have um, the opinion that the, the um, COVID and the shutdown and the reopening of the economy was a watershed event and that the economy fundamentally changed coming out of that. Now, fundamentally changed does not mean it's worse. It doesn't mean dystopian. It means it's different. And the nearest I can come up with is an analogy, and others have used this analogy too, is after World War II. In September 45, when, when the war was over, we all knew that the world was going to be a different place moving forward. We weren't going backwards. Uh, here, there is some pushback about we are going to go backwards. Don't worry, we're going to return to normal. We're going to reopen. Everybody's going to go back to the office five days a week. I don't think that's going to be the case at all. I think we're moving forward. And so it's a watershed event. And also, pandemics, like you had um, in 1918, everybody knows about that one, but there's been other ones. There's one in 1957, there was the Hong Kong flu in 1968, which some people think the super spreader event for that event was Woodstock in 1969. Uh, and, you know, but what you see coming out of pandemics is an acceleration of trends. So these trends that we're seeing like work from home, and some of the other trends, we were going to do that anyway. We're just doing it faster. It's not that it created it. It just sped it up. No, that's such a good point. And I've heard also Lynn Alden compare this current time period to the 1940s because of the debt levels, because we really didn't have that much debt back in the 1970s and 80s. But in the 40s, we did. Is that something that you you looked at as well? Yes, yes. Um, you know, you had the the all-time high debt to GDP for the United States was 1945. Uh, it's not now. It's very close now to being at that 1945 high. And that's because you were financing the war. We financed the war through war bonds uh, and we took out a lot of debt in order to finance the war. And not surprisingly, coming out of that period, a period of big, a per an epic period of change, a period of high debt, and a period of microscopically low interest rates. Mm -hmm. Because prior to the last three or four years, the lowest interest rate seen um, in 200 years of data in the United States was 1946, when we hit a 2% on the 10-year yield. And we got to nearly zero, nearly zero, not quite, on very on short-term interest rates. So there was a, there's a lot more comparisons to that period than we see now, um, than, than just debt levels. I saw you take out that interest rate book in one of your interviews that you did recently. Yeah. And so bef before we get back into macro, I'm just kind of curious, how did you build your career? Because you have your research firm now, um, you you graduated from school, I think you have your MBA, right? How how did you, you build this um, expertise that you have? Because you do look at things from a different angle and you don't always have the same uh, perspective that Wall Street does. Yeah, so... <clears throat> I got my MBA in the 80s as well, too. And I worked on Wall Street. I worked at the uh, in the equity research department at First Boston, uh, which is Credit Suisse now, which might actually go back to being called First Boston again, if you've seen some of the recent stories with them. So I was there during the 87 crash in the aftermath of the crash. And then I went to UBS Securities um, right after that. 1990, I, I left New York, came back to Chicago and I started working as the director of research for Arbor Research and Trading, a fixed income brokerage firm located in suburban Chicago, in actually Barrington, Illinois. And I was, uh, I said, like I said, I was director of research. I was also the only person in the, in the research department. So I got to call myself the director <laughs> from 1990 to 1998. And then in 98, with Arbor, I spun myself off into Bianco Research. So now we're in our 24th year. And Arbor has still, continued to be my my partner throughout all of this period. You know, I own some of Arbor Research and Trading, Arbor Research and Trading owns some of my company um, as well. So over that period, my main thrust has been a macro bent, but most of my clients have been fixed income clients. Mm -hmm. So I've always looked at the market. And for most of that period too, when you talk macro, 
it was more applicable to the fixed income markets. You know, if, if you wanted to talk about what interest rates or the economy or inflation was going to do, there was a play in the bond market. Um, you know, then you'd get the Jim Cramers yelling at you, I need three timbles in order to figure out what I'm supposed to do with this inflation story in the in the stock market. Well, now there's actually TIP securities and TLT and TBT, which is the inverse of TLT. So there's lots of ways you can play that today, but back then there wasn't. So I was really into the bond market and I was into the bond market during the fallow years that, you know, <clears throat> interest rates were at zero and no one cared about the bond market. And it was kind of a useless appendage that everybody thought it was. And now all of a sudden there is a yield again and the bond market is getting very interesting. Thank you very much, Jay Paul. You've been very good for my career in the last couple of years uh, <laughs> by, by, raising rate, by, by raising interest rates. So I've spent, you know, a good 25 or 30 years kind of analyzing and thinking more about not only macro primarily, but secondarily uh, the fixed income markets. Well, can you give us a lay of the land of the fixed income market as it currently is? How big is it? And maybe what are the shifts that you're seeing lately? Well, big, the fixed income market, you know, is the biggest securities market in the world. It is uh, it is much larger. It's about twice the size of the uh, of of all of the world equity markets right now. Uh, and uh, the the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Index, just to use one measure, has got about a fifty five trillion dollar um, market capitalization. Uh, the the Bloomberg U.S. Aggregate Index, and it's what the word implies, aggregate, has about twelve thousand bonds, and it has about twenty six trillion dollars of market cap. So in the, in the US, the stock market and the bond market are roughly around equal sizes. What's interesting about the bond market is this year has been a horrifically bad year. The total returns, that is the coupon you get, remember you started the year with no coupon, mm -hmm. plus the price change is giving you some equity type losses. Mm -hmm. The global aggregate index is down 21% year to date. The um, U.S. aggregate index is down around 15% or 16% year to date. As most bond people I know have said to me, if you would have told me in January that the bond market, the global index would be down 21% and the U.S. aggregate index was down 16%, I would have said, you don't understand the bond market. It doesn't do that because its worst year ever since 1976 was down 2.9%, down 2.9%. Now it's down 16 on the on the on the U.S. aggregate index. The worst year on the, ever on the global index was 1999 when it lost five percent. Now it's down 21. So the bond market has been just a horrifically bad place to invest. And you've seen this. Bank of America's pointed out that the ten, the total return in the 10 year Treasury is the worst. And I'm not exaggerating here. It's the worst year since 1788. Yes, 1788. Uh, the stock bond 60-40 uh, portfolio is having its fourth worst year since 1871. A lot of these losses are being driven by the losses in the bond market. Remember, when rates go up as much as they have, prices fall. When you start with a very small coupon, <clears throat> there's very little cushion to falling prices, at least in 1980. When, it, when the bond market was getting crushed in terms of prices falling, you started with a 13 or 14% coupon. Mm -hmm. So they had the prices had to fall 13 to 14% before you broke even. Beginning of this year, they only had to fall 30 or 40 basis points before you broke even. And then they kind of proceeded to get worse from there. You know, I think it's really interesting that so many people don't understand the bond market, and it really is one of the most important things to look at. And a lot of my listeners and viewers, honestly, before Bitcoin, weren't really familiar with this space. And they're kind of learning as uh, as they go down the rabbit hole, so to speak, of Bitcoin, which was which was my experience as well, because financial literacy really needs to change in this country, in my opinion. But um, could you kind of explain in a simple way how we sort of got to a sovereign debt crisis? Uh, that's what a lot of the analysts are calling this because we've kicked the can down the road. And now the the biggest problem is at the sovereign debt level where countries don't want our treasuries anymore. I believe it's hedge funds recently that are the biggest purchasers of bonds. Um, and they are are not the, the they're, they're more fickle creditors 
if, if you might agree with that. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we got here as we've seen interest rates decrease, decrease over this secular bull market where you pretty much could have, you know, closed your eyes and had money in stocks and, and, and had profit at the end of the year. Meanwhile, bonds, we've gone to a, a 0% interest rate until, until recently. How can you explain that evolution to people that don't maybe have the kind of finance background that you do? Yeah, we actually went to negative interest rates in Europe and in Japan as well, too. And, and, um, and a concept that most people thought was impossible before we actually uh, pulled it off. But let me just start off real quick with the bond market. One of the reasons a lot of people don't know a lot about the bond market is you can't really trade it. It is more of a professional market uh, for uh, banks and brokerage and hedge funds <coughs> and the like. It is, you know, bonds, they used to be in the 60s and 70s, but not anymore. Bonds are not really listed on the New York Stock Exchange. You, you don't call up and say, I want to buy, you know, the 2032 Treasury or the AT&T corporate bond that, issue, that matures in 2040. Um, like I said, you could have maybe 50 years ago, but you can't anymore. So a lot of retail investors don't understand that market because they don't have any, any direct access to it except for like the TLTs, which is mm -hmm. the 20-year treasury um, ETF. Now, one of the reasons that the market stays that way is that there's a lot of rules associated with banks and brokerage firms that make it advantageous for them to own treasury securities. And as a big kicker for all these professional investors, there are no margin requirements in the bond market. So you can buy treasuries, you can buy most bonds on infinite leverage if you want to. And that's what we refer to as the carry trade. I buy a billion dollars worth of bonds. I don't have a billion dollars. Don't worry. I use them as collateral to take out a billion dollar loan and I pay the interest on the loan. And then hopefully the bonds yield more in a positive rate curve, which we don't have right now, than the loan. So I create positive yield. And as long as the price doesn't move on me, I make out. But then when the price does move on you, it can be very, very painful. And we've seen long-term capital management in 1998, um, you know, and some others uh, uh, blow up, uh, you know, is in 2008 as well, when the bond market gets in trouble. So like I said, most people don't understand the bond market because it is a professional market. And because it's a professional market, they give you all these leverage options. Now, the leverage options are important because when interest rates went to zero, why would anybody own bonds? They don't yield anything. They don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I could buy a billion dollars of them and I don't need any money. Uh, you know, <clears throat> All I need is a broker to be willing to extend them to me and give me a repo loan. <clears throat> and that's what a hedge fund is. So what's happened in a lot of the schemes in the bond market over the last several years, UK pensions mm -hmm. um, is an example. They've been employing a lot of derivatives and leverage. Because their assumption was these rates are near zero, they're going to stay near zero, mm -hmm. and the central bank will never allow these rates to go back up. Because every time the rates go back up, the central bank will step in enormously, print money to buy bonds, and push those yields back down. So embedded in the bond market is a lot of derivatives and a lot of leverage. Well, a lot of that is really getting stressed badly this year. We've had some, you know talk on the edges, the British pension funds, some big brokerage firms, Credit Suisse being the, the, the flavor of the month recently as far as having problems. But most likely, there is a lot of problems in the bond market. Now, as far as the sovereign debt crisis goes, um, who was the biggest buyer of bonds before the pandemic? It was the central banks themselves. <laughs> and just remember how a central bank works when they buy bonds. The so central bank will call, has dealers that deal with them, we we'll call them primary dealers. <clears throat> They'll call up a primary dealer, say a JP Morgan or a Bank of America or Citibank or Goldman Sachs, take your pick. And they'll say, sell to me, I'm the central bank, sell to me $10 million worth of five-year notes. Okay, we agree on a price and you sold me $10 million worth of five-year notes. Now I'm the central bank, I owe you five, I owe you $10 million for the purchase of those bonds. How do I pay you? You have a reserve account with me as the central bank. I'll just go into that reserve account and I'll just increase the number in your reserve account by $10 million. That's quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. Now, if a central bank- Printing money. A yes, that's printing money. I was going to say, if a central bank, if a commercial bank does that, everybody goes to jail because that's fraud and everything. <laughs> but when a central bank does it, it's sophisticated quantitative easing. And so that's how we've, 
cotton to this money printing thing. So who was buying bonds when they were at zero? The central banks were. Mm -hmm. The central banks were buying bonds. So you get now to the last year and a half or so, inflation is starting to move higher. Um, all of a sudden, the central banks have wheeled it around and they're doing quantitative tightening. Bond prices are falling. No one wants to touch these things. And so what you wind up with is a rout in the bond market, one of the worst years that we've ever seen. And along the way, the stock market has been down 25% at its lows about two weeks ago, more than 30% on the NASDAQ. That would rank as one of the two or three worst years in the last generation for the stock market should it end here. And so this has been the issue with the market is that the Fed is the banker for the Treasury. The Treasury has been issuing bonds and they've still been getting their bonds issued, but at much, much higher interest rates uh, in order to in order to move this paper. Now, it's not a problem for the Treasury now, but if these interest rates stay at these three, four, five percent levels in the next several years, the interest burdens on the U.S. taxpayer are going to grow quite a bit. Let me explain. Let me reemphasize that in the next couple of years, if this higher rates that we've seen last two years, one year, another six months, not such a problem for the taxpayer. But if it continues to be uh, um, at these high rates, it could be. And that all really comes down to whether or not we have more persistent inflation or less than persistent inflation. Well, first of all, thank you so much for that explanation. This is one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you because you have a great way of breaking things down in such a simplistic way for people to understand. So first of all, I appreciate that. Um, second, let's talk a little bit about um, some of your recent uh, analyses because I find them to be really interesting and uh, and contradictory to what some of the big analysts and talking heads on TV say. Uh, a lot of people are expecting a pivot. They're just waiting because what? The central bank has always pivoted, right? Um, the, the stock market is down. But even though there are cracks, nothing has fully broken. And and I know a, a friend of mine and, and analyst, Sven Henrik, he's, he's said multiple times how impressed he is with the orderly breakdown right now. Nothing's really you know capitulated to the point where they have to pivot. And employment, I think you mentioned in a recent podcast, still relatively strong. So um, tell me a little bit about where we're at right now heading into this next Fed meeting where most people are expecting 75 basis points. Um, you know, things have cracked. On the margins, we've seen the, the UK bank pivot. We're seeing issues in Japan. But again, nothing has fully broken that would cause them to actually pivot. So where are we at right now? So for, on that last point first, as far as you're right, nothing is really broken. We've seen some, some stuff on the edges. We've seen, <clears throat> like we were talking about, liability-driven investing, which is a pension scheme in the UK, had a, had a problem. We've rumored about people like Credit Suisse. We've seen some stress points with the Bank of Japan trying to continue yield curve control of 25 basis points on their 10-year yield, but nothing's really busted wide open. And since we're a crypto podcast, let's go back to remember when uh, the Terra blockchain uh, failed in May, and then we, you know, the gates of hell opened up, and we had Voyager and Three Arrows Capital mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, uh, a couple of other uh, protocols, you know, blow up. Typically, you know, because it's interesting to point that out because what was it until the Terra blockchain broke that we were saying the sell-off in crypto was orderly, it was orderly. It was showing that the system was resilient and then everything exploded all at once. When you get to the point where there is breakage, things are breaking. You know, the Saturday afternoon meetings at the New York Fed, like... I remember in 08, we were watching, you know, it was September of 08, and I was going back and forth between CNBC doing live updates on a Saturday afternoon at the New York Fed about what we're going to do about the problems in the market and watching football, uh, you know, going back and forth between the two. When we get to that point, it's usually the end of the move. Usually when you break something like that, like it was when we saw the aftermath of the Terra blockchain going down. It's usually very close to the end of the move. And for the moment, the end of the move, when we got to like $900 on ETH, was very soon thereafter. And we've been, you know, we're almost 100% higher, about 80% higher. So yes, we haven't broken anything, but I wouldn't expect that to happen until the end of the move. And it's almost like, well, since things aren't broken and we're highly stressed, maybe the end of the move is not here just yet, at least in that perspective. 
So we'll have to see whether or not things continue, um, you know, unraveling. And there's a there's a chance that they might. Now, on your other question about the pivot, you know, we've been using these terms. We've been using these terms all year. In June, it was called the pause, <laughs> and then it didn't play out, and the market tanked to new lows. And then in August, we were calling it the pivot. And then Jay Powell went to Jackson Hole, gave an eight minute speech and said, there'd be no pivot. And then the stock market tanked to new lows. And now in the last 10 days or so, we're using a new phrase. It's called step down, that the Fed is going to go from a 50 basis point, a 75 basis point hike at this week's meeting. We're recording two days before the Fed meeting on November 2nd to a 50 basis point move on the December 14th meeting. Now, that doesn't sound like it's marginally different. It isn't. But it's believed to be a signal that this is the beginning of the end of the cycle, that the Fed has realized that they've gone about as far as they can. We're going to take a quick break from the show to hear these messages from my sponsors. First up, I trust capital. Do you save in Bitcoin for your retirement in your IRA? I trust capital allows you to invest in Bitcoin and other digital assets with the tax benefits of an IRA. And unlike the stock market, you can buy and sell 24 hours a day. Instead of paying taxes on Bitcoin gains every year, you can defer taxes using an iTrust crypto IRA or with an iTrust capital Roth IRA, you can withdraw tax-free at retirement. iTrust recently hit a milestone of $6 billion in total transactions across the platform, and that's $6 billion in tax-advantaged accounts that those 87,000 new IRS agents can't do anything about. The iTrust Capital platform is easy to use and only takes a few minutes to set up. And if you want to start investing with a $100 bonus, head to itrust.capital slash Natalie Brunel. Next up, let's talk about Bitcoin 2023. That is the biggest Bitcoin conference in the world. And take a look at the video from last year in Miami. It was an incredible event that was jam-packed with the best speaking sessions, workshops, and networking events that I've been to in the space. I had the chance to live anchor the Bitcoin Magazine News Desk and serve as MC. And it was such a full circle moment for me to be at that conference because the first one I attended was Bitcoin 2021 in Miami. Me, and that's where I actually launched the Coin Stories podcast. I went on a media pass because I used to be a reporter and I actually went backstage and started asking the speakers like Michael Saylor and Preston Pish if they would come on my show. And they did. And a year later, I'm back at the conference as someone who actually has a career now in Bitcoin. So you never know what can happen at these events. I highly recommend going so you can meet other people that share the same values and passion for Bitcoin. And if you want your ticket at a 10% discount, head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L. I'll see you there. But it's believed to be a signal that this is the beginning of the end of the cycle, that the Fed has realized that they've gone about as far as they can. I think that all of this talk, pause, pivot, step down, comes from a pre-COVID era, that the Fed has got my back. The Fed wants to make sure that I get a maximum bonus and I get to buy the plaid tessel, because that's all that I really care about. And that the Fed will do everything they can to get me into a plaid Tesla. And when the Fed is fighting me to get into my plaid Tesla, of course, I'm being sarcastic here, <laughs> that I can't believe that they would actually do it. Oh, yes, they are doing that. They don't want you to buy a plaid Tesla. As a matter of fact, they want you to keep driving whatever you're driving and just repair it and keep going with it. And why is that? Because the game changer of all game changers has occurred. We have inflation. Yep. Now, the problem with the inflation argument, and this gets to some of the things I've been arguing, the vast majority of people still believe inflation is the word we're not, the Voldemort word we're not allowed to say, transitory. It is. They still believe it is a one-time event that is an artifact of reopening the economy post-COVID, got us to 9% inflation, and it's going to peak, and inflation is going to go back to 2%. And that's going to be the end of it. And Jay Paul, you're going way too much hiking 75 basis points every meeting if that's what's going to happen. I don't think that's happening. I think we are in a more persistent inflation world where, yes, I believe we've peaked or we are peaking in terms of core inflation. And yes, I believe that over the next several months, inflation will probably go lower. But no, I don't think we're going to come anywhere near 2%. 
and we're going to stay materially higher than that. And if we do, then the era of 4% interest rates might only be neutral. It might not be a restrictive rate. And that restrictive interest rates are still to come at much higher levels. And if that breaks things, it breaks things. If it breaks things bad enough that it creates a, fin a full-blown financial crisis, then the Fed will say, well, a full-blown financial crisis will also kill inflation. We could respond to that. So if you're waiting for your Plaid Tesla and you're waiting for Jay to make sure that you get into it, um, keep waiting because he's not. This is the biggest issue that I think, especially this really cuts to tech investors, that tech investors are really getting hammered because of this higher rates. And they keep whining mm -hmm. about that the Fed is going too far. Kathy Wood wrote an open letter to the Fed. Please stop, Jay, please stop. That's the way I, I termed it. Um, but they're not. They're not going to because I believe that Jay is more thinking like I do that this inflation problem is a little more persistent and that there has been a secular change post-pandemic. Can you expand a little bit on this idea that there's sort of a new regime in the Fed and how, I guess, realistic it is to have um, interest rates that are higher? Can we sustain that? Because obviously we have so much debt in the system. We are going to have fewer tax receipts because of what's happening to equities and 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 the, the fact that employment is starting to tick down a little bit. We've got so many issues on, on a macro level that's not going to provide the financing to the government when it comes to, to tax receipts. And on top of that, the interest rates, now they're going to be servicing so much debt at a higher interest rate. I mean, that creates sort of a debt spiral and a debt doom loop, doesn't it? So can can they be as hawkish as they claim to be when the math just isn't really there? You know, yes. So as far as the doom loop with the debt spiral, um, the concept is sound, except like I said earlier, you got to have interest rates at four five or 6% for three to five years in order to really start talking about a doom loop scenario. We've only had 4% interest rates for about three or four weeks. So we can, can we can, from a taxpayer standpoint, sustain these much higher interest rates for a while before the taxpayers got a problem. The financial system's got the bigger problem. Um, the wipeout in unprofitable tech stocks, the ARC fund, those types of things, those are considered long duration assets. They're more sensitive to interest rates. What I mean by long duration assets, let me explain that real quickly. If you look at an S&P 500 company, it makes money now. It has profits every year and you expect more profits in the future. So if you did an average duration of the amount of cash flow that you would get from an S&P 500 company, because you're making a lot of money now and you'll be making a little bit more money later, it's not that long of an average duration. If you look at an unprofitable tech or something like that the ARC Fund would buy, most of those companies are making no money now. You know, the, the Pelotons and the Zooms of the world. Mm -hmm. And you expect or you hope that in five years, they're going to be making billions of dollars. So the duration of their cash flows is very long. Mm -hmm. That's the way we measure the bond market. When you have du long durations, you are more sensitive to interest rates. This is why when interest rates go up, it kills all of these speculative tech companies, it kills the ARC fund, why the NASDAQ is down so much more than the S&P 500. And so th this is why interest rates matter. So yeah, the taxpayer will be a problem in three years. The problem now is a lot of people are getting wiped out and they're not going to get unwiped out if we, if, unless we were to get to return to an era of two or 1% interest rates. The only way we return to that era is if we return to an era of 2% inflation consistently. And I don't think we're going to do that. The whole thing like liability driven investing in the UK and a lot of other schemes and hedge funds that do the carry trade, they're all operating on leverage under the assumption that interest rates are going to stay low and stable for a long time. They may not. And it, in which case they're going to be under a lot of stress as well. The Fed knows this. Uh, the Fed is OK with this because they believe that that risk of a bunch of people, you know, I'll stick with my, my metaphor here, a bunch of people that want to buy Tad Teslas, so we blow them up, so what? They can, they'll figure it out themselves. 
the Fed is more concerned about 40% of the population that owns no assets. They don't own a home. They don't have a stock portfolio and they rent. Those people are being summarily killed mm -hmm. by inflation and they want to rein in inflation to help those 40%. So if a bunch of people that are, you know, fairly wealthy with portfolios are getting hurt, man, good luck is basically where I think the Fed is. If they get hurt to the point where it's going to impair the entire financial system, then the Fed will step in. But first, they have to be hurt to impair the financial system. They are not going to preemptively stop. So I get what everybody's hoping for mm -hmm. with the pause, the pivot, and now the step down. But I think they're fundamentally misreading the situation. And they 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 keep hoping for what they want, but not what the Fed is trying to communicate to them. Is one of the reasons that you think they can they can keep going with the interest rate hikes because, you know, if push comes to shove with treasury liquidity, um, there are these different levers they can pull. They can allow for, you know, the the big banks to hold more treasuries. Um, they can allow for foreign swaps. I mean, basically, are you saying that there's a way for them to keep kicking the can down the road? Well, they could do that, but I think it's even more fundamental than that. <clears throat> um I think that the Fed and I, this is my, I'm channeling my own thoughts. And I think the Fed must be consistent with these thoughts. There is nothing worse than inflation. It is blow up the damn stock market. Who cares? It's not important when it comes to reining in inflation. I say that just to get my point across mm -hmm. that, that they have to bring in inflation and they, that that is such a terrible thing to have inflicted on an economy. It's been such a long time since we've seen it. And so we all worry about what about the returns of the stock market? And and if, if we don't have returns in the stock market, what does that mean for reverse wealth effect? It's not good. It's definitely not good. But to say, no, we have to keep easier policy because we have to keep supporting financial assets and if if we're going to just consign 40% of the population to some serfdom that you can never make ends meet because you don't own stocks and they don't go up because you're not wealthy enough to own stocks. You don't own a house. You rent and you have to pay 8% more for everything this year versus last year. And you only got a 4 or 5% raise. You've got a permanent loss of your standard of living. And- for those people, that matters because they don't have a lot of excess standard of living like maybe I do. You know, you know, maybe my stock portfolio goes down and I have a loss of a standard of living, but I have an excess standard of living. So nothing really changes. I just get grumpy that a number in a bank account or a brokerage account goes down, but I don't change my life. Their lifestyle has to change because of this. So the reason I'm pointing this up, is this is where I think they're thinking is Jay Powell has pointed this out many times this year about the scourge of inflation. I think he's right. And I think what he's also what he's also pointed out is that there will be a price to bringing down inflation. If that is a bear market in stocks, if that is higher unemployment, mm -hmm. uh, then we're going to have to tolerate some of that. And I think he's right because I think we've forgotten how bad inflation can be. And what you hear most people push back with is not that they've forgotten how bad it is, it's that, oh, no, it's not that bad. It's going to go away. It's going to go away. That is inflation. It's going to go away in two years. Just be patient. Uh, and, and you'll see that we didn't need this policy. Well, it sounds like um, I think you said earlier that you think that they're going to keep the interest rates around the 4%. And if they have to lower, um, that they would lower to maybe 2%. It's not going to be that zero interest rate that we saw over the last decade with all the quantitative easing post a great financial crisis. Um, but there are analysts who say there's no way with our with our debt levels, there's no way that we can sustain something like that. So what are we missing here? Why why, why are some people so uh, bullish on the, on the idea that the Fed could actually accomplish this for at least a couple of years? And why are others saying absolutely not? Because I think that they're, they're, they've got their ideas right, but I think that they've got their timing off. Um, yes, if we are going into an era of, of sustainably higher interest rates, four, five, six percent for a decade, in five to 10 years, we're going to have a real problem on our hands servicing this debt. But if we're going to go to four, five, six percent for one or two or three years, we're not. Mm. And so I think that, that, that it's merely a case of timing as it is opposed to a case of um, uh, 
of concept. The concept is right. The, the, the Treasury has issued $30 trillion worth of Treasury securities, $30 trillion, more than the stock market. They only roll over about, what I mean by roll over, most of that stuff has been issued. It's got a fixed payment mm -hmm. that the Treasury has to pay. They only roll over about one and a half to $2 trillion a year of that debt. So higher interest rates means $28 trillion of, of interest payments this year are the same as last year. In, in next year, it'll be 26 will be the same as it was two years ago, 24 Mm -hmm. trillion will be the same. So it's going to take time to get those higher interest rates and those mm -hmm. higher debt payments into the system. Got patience, it. patience. They got to be patient. Their idea is right. It's just that if 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 Jay wants to take interest rates to five or 6% and crush inflation, it's not going to be a burden on the taxpayer if he crushes inflation and then has to bring rates right back down. It would be if he has to take them up there and leave them there for an extended period of time. Do you think that there's also a strategy to weaponize the dollar given what's happening with Russia and and also China? I think there's been a strategy to weaponize uh, financialization and the dollar is one of those. 85% um, of all trade in the world takes place in dollars. And what does that mean? So Total is a French energy company. And if there is a refinery, you know, take your pick, South Korea, and they want to buy crude oil from Total in order to refine it into gasoline for South Korea, it's priced in dollars. If there's a Brazilian company that wants to buy apparel from an Italian company mm -hmm. in order to sell in Brazilian stores, it's priced in dollars. So we have got, as far as the dollar goes, the what Richard Castaigne said in the late 1960s, he was the finance minister of France, an exorbitant privilege mm -hmm. that everything is priced in dollars. You and me as Americans don't ever think about um, having to take the price of something and then convert it into dollars. Europeans do that all the time. They look at the price of things, whether it's gold or crude oil or whatever, and then they have to look at their currency, the euro, and they have to do that mental conversion in their head to mm -hmm. see whether or not it's gotten more or less expensive. We only have to do that when we when we vacation in Europe and then we do it for a week and we get it all wrong and we never quite understand it. And then we have to, when we can forget it when we go home um, as well, or if you go to Canada as well. So what we've seen in the West is using the tool of financialization, whether it's weaponizing the dollar or weaponizing the payment system. Canada famously did that against their truckers that were protesting mm -hmm. um, the vaccine mandates back in January. Um, we did that against the, the the Russian Central Bank when we uh, froze all the assets. Uh, the West froze all of their assets as well. And we've also seen the weaponization of financial financial weaponization in the crypto space. We know that as is all the regulation that all of the alphabet soup of regulators are trying to pour pour down upon crypto. So yes, we are trying to do a lot of that. Now, as far as weaponizing the dollar, if the dollar goes up in value, we have, we, and that means currencies go down in value, mm -hmm. that lowers our inflation rate. We can, for the same amount of dollars, we can buy more foreign stuff. And, and, and uh, you know, because the dollar is worth more, that currency is worth less, that depresses our interest rate. So is there a desire to, you know, see the dollar go up? Yes. Because the um, uh, the number one political issue in the country, bar none, is inflation. Number two is the economy. Number three, take your pick of whatever you want. It's yeah. well distant over one and two. President Biden has made no bones about it that, you know, he is, as we're talking here, um, he is literally moments away from giving a speech where he's going to essentially, if, if if the comments are correct, maybe partially nationalize the energy industry through a windfall profits tax because he wants the price of gasoline down because it's such a big driver of inflation. So yes, if you want to see the dollar go up, that is a depressant on inflation. And there is all the political incentive in the world to see that go up. Now, the rest of the world hates it, hates it tremendously that it's going up. Tough. 
you're not, we are the reserve currency. You are not. Okay. I have two questions from that. Number one, what did you think of Nancy Pelosi just a week ago saying, um, as far as inflation, we should change the subject. And then I think it was a couple of days later, Christine Lagarde, I know you tweeted about this with the the ECB saying that inflation came out of nowhere. I mean, these are the political leaders. It, it is, are they acting out of ignorance or malice at this point? No, they're, they're acting out of self-interest. Nancy Pelosi is just announcing that we've lost the, the debate or we've lost the argument about inflation. So let's change the subject. So let's just stop talking about it. Uh, that's all that really means. And Christine Lagarde, um, yeah, I mean, you know, she goes out and she says that inflation came out of the blue. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. I mean, there was a lot of people who don't work at the ECB and the uh, and the Federal Reserve that were making credible arguments that there was going to be a, a rebound of inflation post-COVID. Uh, what the policies of the ECB and the Federal Reserve were and the fiscal policies out of Brussels with the EU and the United States out of Washington was almost demanding that there would be some kind of an inflationary impulse out of those policies with all the money printing and borrowing and mailing of check, you know, mailing checks to everybody that we were going mm-hmm. to see some kind of version of that. And yes, we have seen that. Um, so, I mean, I, I get it. She's, she's trying to say that, no, it came out of the blue. What she's trying to say is I blew it. I got it wrong. <laughs> I have, I am the head of the ECB and I have one job and that is I have one mandate. And that is to keep inflation at 2%. And it's at 11 now. And so I failed at my job. Oh, but but nobody saw this coming. No, you failed at your job, Christine, full Mm -hmm. stop. And uh, so you should, you know, own up to it, but she won't own up to it. She'll just say that no one saw it coming and all of this other stuff. A lot of people say that the the Fed is backwards looking and there's so many lagging indicators. So what do you think the Fed is missing? Going into this next meeting, uh, what are you concerned about that they might not be seeing right now? We're going to take another quick break to hear these messages from my sponsors. First up, Fold. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase from Amazon to your groceries with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card and Win free Satoshis every day or even a whole Bitcoin by spinning the daily wheel and the purchase rewards wheels. I actually have an alarm set every single day so that I never miss out on spinning the daily wheel and earning free sats. And, you know, I have to say that Fold is one of the best ways to get someone completely new into Bitcoin because they can start earning it and learning about it and using it. So if you want to sign up and join the fun, head to foldapp.com slash Natalie for 5,000 in free sats. All right, now I want to tell you about a company called CrowdHealth, which is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to health insurance. Because let's be honest, health insurance sucks. The government and insurance companies have jacked up prices. They've made things super complex. And when you send your money in, it essentially goes into the health insurance black hole, and then you never see it again, even if you don't get sick and you don't need medical services because, you know, you don't eat fiat foods. But then if you actually do get sick or you need care... You have to send them more money because something ends up not being covered. The great news is there's now an alternative brought to you by Bitcoiners, and it is called CrowdHealth. It is very different from insurance. Instead of sending your hard-earned money to an insurance company, you hold your money in an account that CrowdHealth helps you set up. And you can even convert the dollars in your account to Bitcoin. Now, the company is all about community. Remember, it's called crowd health. So when someone in the community is in need, needs care, needs help, you can choose to actually use the money in your account to help them, or you can keep it in your account. And if you ever leave crowd health, you can take the money that's left with you. If you want to learn more and sign up, you can head to crowdhealth.com slash Natalie. Now back to the show. Going into this next meeting, uh, what are you concerned about that they might not be seeing right now? Well, yeah, I mean, what people are pointing out is correctly so is that the Fed is focused on inflation, core inflation, PC inflation, CPI inflation, whichever measure you want, but they all fall into the same category that they're lagging indicators. They're, they they lag the business cycle. Now, lagging indicators are useful because they actually give you a precise measurement on how big the cycle has been, but they don't they don't move ahead of the cycle. So why is the Fed focused on lagging indicators? That is a very good question. Why is the Fed focused on it? Now, the way I've answered it is, of all the Fed speech that you hear, Jay Powell talking about not pivoting and the scourge of inflation, 
and all these Fed governors and presidents talking about we're going to raise 75 at the next meeting. Maybe we'll step down in December. What you don't hear from any of them is a big picture. What is the inflation rate over the next three, four, five years? Why do we think it's going back to 2%? Or why do we think it's not going back to 2%? Give that speech, Jay. Either one, take your pick. Now, he doesn't. And why doesn't he give that speech? My take on that is the Fed cannot agree. I think that within the Federal Reserve, there's Jay Powell. And I think he's more along my lines that inflation is something that is, you know, the cycle is turned and we've got more persistent inflation and it might, yes, it's peaked at eight. It's not going to stay at eight. It's going to go down, but it's going to stop at some materially level level higher than 2%, which is where it was pre-pandemic, mm-hmm. maybe four, maybe three and a half or some level, level higher. I think Chris Waller, a Fed governor, thinks like that. I think Jim Bullard, the St. Louis Federal Reserve president, thinks like that as well, too. But I think on the other side, there's Leo Brainerd, the vice chairman of the Fed. I think there's Mary Daly, the San Francisco Fed president. I think there's um, Charlie Evans, the Chicago Fed president, and maybe the staff of the Fed itself, all the economists who work at the Fed, that don't think that, that think that this is a one-time artifact of reopening a post a pandemic economy. Inflation will peak and it will return to 2% organically by itself. They can't agree. What they can agree on at the Fed is the way the Fed operates. The chairman gets what the chairman wants. And Jay Powell wants 75 basis point hikes every meeting. So they go out and they say, we're going to have 75 basis point hikes. So when you ask the question, why are we raising rates 75 basis points? What is it that you're what is it that you're trying to do? All you're trying to keep inflation to, to being unanchored. Why do you need to raise rates 75? What's your bigger picture, Jay? What if we didn't raise rates 75? What would happen? He doesn't give that speech because within the Fed, they can't agree. Hmm. All they can agree on is Jay Powell wants 75 every meeting. And that's all we get out of them is we get this interminable talk about what is he going to say on Wednesday? Is he going to step down in December? That's all short-termism. That's all that is. There is no bigger picture. Why did you take the rates from zero to the high end of the rates are going to be 4% on Wednesday if you raise 75 basis points in less than a year, and actually about eight months. You took them from zero to 4% in about eight months, which is an extraordinary move. Why did we do that? What inflation are you concerned about? Again, I don't think they, they can. So what everybody says is they must be looking at the inflation numbers, and they're lagging. Why are they looking at lagging numbers? Mm-hmm. I don't think they are. I just don't think that they can agree upon that speech because I think the, the and why can't they agree on it? Because when the chairman says, I want 75, everybody goes out and says, we're going to raise 75. Mm-hmm. If the chairman says there's an, a persistent inflation problem, I think there's people like Charlie Evans, Mary Daly, Leo Brainerd that say, no, I'm not giving that speech. I don't believe that. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's a problem with how the Fed operates. Like I said, if the Supreme Court operated like the Fed, we would have a revolution in this country that, you know, we all look to Justice Roberts, the um, Chief Justice Roberts, how do you want me to vote on this issue? Okay, I'll right. vote however you tell me. But that's the way the Fed works. Mm-hmm. Chief Justice Roberts, well, how, what should I go out and tell everybody about this vote? Just write me some talking points and I'll go say them. They, 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 they don't, we would, we right. would go crazy if we talk, if, if, if the, if the Supreme Court was like that, but right. that's exactly how the Fed works. You know, it's, it's so interesting. It makes me kind of think about why he's even in that position, because I, I understand that Jay Powell's worth like a hundred or $150 million. Why, why does he want to be the inflation fall guy? <laughs> he's well, you know, he's the, he's the second, the, the argument is the Federal Reserve chairman is the second most powerful man in Washington and, uh, you know, power trumps money at times for, uh, for a lot of people. And he likes the position that he is in now, now that I've said that I'm, I, I'm not as cynical as that might sound that he's, it's just a power grab. There's some of that, that is a civic duty that he believes that he could do as good a job in that position as anybody else. And he believes that if there is an inflation problem, that he is probably best situated to address that inflation problem. Actually, I, I might not disagree with that. Hmm. It's just that, um, you know, the, the, the problem is somewhat of his making, because I've often argued that mm-hmm. people scream, 
the Fed is making a policy, a terrible policy mistake by raising rates so much this year. And I've always said, no, the policy mistake was last year, not mm -hmm. starting to raise rates in baby steps. This year is the consequence. So yes, did Jay make a mistake last year? Sure. But virtually anybody else put in that chair would have made exactly the same mistake. And is he better situated to maybe correct that mistake in 22 and 23? He might be. But that doesn't mean it's going to be simple or it's going to be painless. The mistake has already been made. You know, you know, um, you, you know, you've already fallen off the you've already fallen off the 50 foot cliff. You're going to hit the ground and it's going to hurt. There mm -hmm. is no what is the scenario where I could just walk away from this without a scratch? There isn't one. And it's going to it's going to hurt quite a bit. And maybe he's best suited to do it. What do you think inflation will be next year this time? I think it'll probably be around three and a half percent plus or minus 50 basis points, maybe as high as four, as low as three. Why is that important? Because a the Fed, I think correctly is argued, neutral on interest rates. And this is a concept that's not an exact measure, should be about half a percentage point above the inflation rate. So if inflation is three and a half percent, then neutral is four. Maybe as high as four and a half if it's closer to four, maybe as low as three and a half if it's closer to three. So if you're looking at the, the 10 year treasury somewhere around 4%, it's basically at neutral. Mm -hmm. It has not been restrictive. And if you want to bring that inflation rate down from three and a half to 4% back to two, you're probably going to go have to go to a restrictive level. So that might mean five, or even higher on the 10 year note before the cycle is over, is completely over. Now, why would you want to do that? Why not just say the new neutral is 3%? Because again, those people that are 40% of the population, look, 40% of the population, the other statistic I forgot to give you about them is they have less than a thousand dollars of savings. Right. And they rent and they, they don't own stocks. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to tell them, you better get a three to four percent raise every single year for the foreseeable future just to break even so you can buy the same amount of things at the grocery store next year as you did this year. That is an awful position to put them in. So I completely get the argument that inflation is a scourge. Like I said, I think the problem is there's too many people that can see their net worth decline by 25% and then whine about it, but not change anything about their lifestyle. Whereas those 40% with less than $1,000 in savings, if their net worth declines by 25%, there's wholesale changes in their life because mm -hmm. they have no margin for error like the rest of us do. So I think that he's got the right idea. Like I said, I'm not going to let him off the hook completely. He maybe he should have been and the Fed should have been more attentive to not letting this mistake get out of hand like they did in 20 and 21. But, you know, we are here now. There are analysts out there, including Luke Groman and even I think Peter Schiff uh, feels this way that we might have peaked in inflation in the short term, at least for this year, but that next year we could have double digit 20% inflation. What scenario um, would would create that, that you would say, okay, I, I, I buy that, that could happen? Sure. Um, I've argued that we are in an era, you know, I've kind of hinted around at this, right? That inflation is more persistent. We're in an era where we have ended, what, first of all, pre-pandemic, what kept inflation low? We had cheap labor, we had cheap goods, and we had cheap energy. Mm -hmm. And all three of those I think are over. Cheap labor, labor has the upper hand. We've got, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we've got uh, people don't want to go back to the office. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, uh, unions threatening to strike like the freight workers and uh, longshoremen in the West Coast uh, over working conditions. Now, that's a key point there. Normally in a labor negotiation with the union, 95% of the discussion is what are you going to pay me? What are you going to pay me? They've already agreed on the pay raise. Mm -hmm. um, 24% over five years, 14% immediately. That was agreed two months ago. Now they're arguing about working conditions. You argue working conditions when labor has the upper hand. Mm -hmm. um, people don't want to go back to the office. You know, the, the, the latest example earlier this month, um, Mary Barra, the chairman of General Motors, 
was pushing hard all since Labor Day to get all the office workers back in back, the office yeah. three yeah three days a week. They finally officially gave up on it about three weeks ago. And wow. why did they say that? Because why did why did him? Because employees said, "I'm not going back three days a week. I'll go back two. You want me back three? You can fire me. Otherwise, I'm going to continue to do my job at two. There's been an attitude change about work in this country. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's necessarily misplaced. Um, well, people so, were paid not to work for so long. So <laughs> right, people were paid not to work, and I also think that they started to realize that, you know, an office job kind of sucks. Yeah. And that, you know, they don't really want to go back to the office job as we knew it in 2019. So cheap labor is over. Cheap goods. We're having all kinds of problems with Asia and China in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, what used to happen was we never paid anybody. You didn't get a raise. But the way we offset that was, wait till you see how everything gets ever cheaper and cheaper and cheaper at Walmart. Uh, because we keep importing cheaper and cheaper stuff from China. Mm -hmm. Well, that's now, you know, questionable. We've got, we're putting sanctions on China. We're putting duties and tariffs on China and with zero COVID, um, you know, they are now in a just in time world, an unreliable partner. Um, there was a story today, the day we're, we're recording that they've shut down. Um, let's, let's be sure everybody understands how this works in China. They went and they, they, the government in China was at Shanghai Disney, thousands of people at Shanghai Disney, just like Disneyland in, in, uh, Southern California, Disney World in Florida. And they ask somebody, remember, this is the Chinese government. They ask somebody, I'm going to stick the Schwab in your nose and I'm going to give you a COVID test. You've not, you can't say no. They give you a COVID test. They give another kind of COVID test, a third, a fourth, a fifth. Somebody tests positive. What does that mean? Lock the doors. Thousands of people are now stranded inside Shanghai Disney. No one leaves till they get a bunch of negative tests. That's days and days that they're stuck there. It's crazy. Oh, how do they, yeah. how do they, how do you feed them? Oh, the government will drop off bags of food. And if they, and literally they will drop off. And if they don't drop off a bag of food, you're on a diet today. So what's happened is, and there was another story today that people are leaving in droves, not working for Foxconn, making iPhones in Guangdong. Why? Guangdong is, it's an incredible facility. 200 thousand people work in this facility making iPhones, 200,000. It's a city. It has its own fire department, its police department, it has its own school system wow. just for the workers to make iPhones. What is it that they're afraid of? The government comes in, sticks a swab into somebody's nose. Some person tests positive. I am now stuck at wherever I work or whatever school I'm at or whatever building I'm at right. for days and days on end. And please drop me off a, a bag of food because I haven't eaten in 18 hours or 24 hours or 36 Crazy. hours. And I would like a food that, and what does that mean? That means that all of the processes that you rely upon from China, they're all in chaos right now mm -hmm. because of zero COVID and that's not going away. So cheap energy, cheap labor, uh, cheap goods, excuse me, is over with cheap energy. The largest energy producer, not the largest crude oil producer, but the largest energy producer in the world is Russia. Uh, when you add in crude oil and natural gas and everything else, mm -hmm. it's Russia. Russia has been supplying Europe with cheap energy for decades in the form mainly of natural gas. Mm -hmm. Zoltan Posar at Credit Suisse has pointed out that prior to the pandemic, Europe would get $27 billion of gas every year mm -hmm. and they would turn it into $2 trillion of goods because in any manufacturing mm -hmm. process, yep. the cheapest input is not labor, it's energy. Yep. And they were getting cheap energy from Russia. It is orders of magnitude higher. Yep. So if you've got the era of cheap labor, cheap goods and cheap energy gone, you are in an, a persistently high inflation world. And only when we restructure the economy to find another source of cheap uh, labor, another source of cheap goods, another source of cheap energy. And the last one, that other source of cheap energy might actually be the United States if we would actually allow the energy industry right. in the U.S. to do it, but we won't, right. uh, at least not yet, and Canada too. Um, uh, but we're not ready to go there just yet because of politics. But until we do that, I think we're going to have persistently high inflation. But if we don't have the cheap labor, cheap goods, cheap energy, yet you see, um, you know, inflation at three percent, 
next year versus these other, other analysts saying it's going to be 20. What, where are we missing? How are we that far off? Because because either A, we're going to get an energy spike or we're going to get a total shutdown of goods from China, or maybe we're going to see um, some kind of other revolt among workers um, against uh, either work from home. You know, the other the other revolt that that people start to think that might come out of the work from home scenario is about half of the jobs in the United States, you can work from home. I'm working from home doing this interview with you. But half the jobs in the United States, you can't work from home. A waitress can't work from home. A cop can't work from home. A surgeon can't work from home. At least I don't want my surgeon working from home. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, th those types of those types of jobs. Sooner or later, those people might say, you know what? Uh, this job's terrible. I'd rather take an office job or I'd rather take a service sector job that I get to stay home two or three days a week. Um, so there might be some of some or all of that. You could see another inflationary impulse. And especially if we are coming out of a recession and you see a, a, a surge of demand, oh, the economy is getting better. I'm going to go spend some money. I'm going to go buy my Tesla plaid now and stuff. And, and then you see that surge of, of people wanting to buy stuff. Yeah, I could see another impulse of inflation. 20%, uh, I'm not ready to go quite there, but I could definitely see it revisiting where we are now, eight or 9%, you know, in the next year or two after a dip. That is definitely possible. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you before we pivot a little bit to Bitcoin is just this idea of populism. Uh, and I, I think we we see a rise of it when we're at the at the end of a long-term debt cycle, which we are. And I, I wonder if your sort of um thesis about the Fed regime change also has to do with sort of this idea of populism and the wealth disparity that was created by, you know, over a decade of of quantitative easing and all of that money flowing into assets. Like you mentioned, most people don't own assets um, and most of their equity is in, in homes. Um, so do you think that the Fed is also focused on that and trying to maybe address some of the wealth concentration that they've had a hand in creating? Oh, absolutely. You know, prior... Coming out of the great financial crisis, we had the Occupy Wall Street and we had the Tea Party movement. Actually, Tea Party came first and then Occupy Wall Street second. And, you know, the, the shorthand for that was what's the difference between Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party movement? The Tea Party movement was mad about the bailouts um, mm -hmm. and they blamed the government for the bailouts. Occupy Wall Street was mad about the bailouts and they blamed Wall Street. Mm -hmm. But they both shared the same common theme that they were mad about the bailouts. And coming out of that, 2010, 11, 12, 13, when I would attend conferences or discussions, you know, with official tums, you know, people from Washington or the Fed or something along those lines, they would matter of factly talk about as if it was just accepted understanding that in the next, you know, the next, re the next recession, we're going to have we're going to have the pitchfork and torches crowd at the at the gate. They're going to be so mad, and we have to do something to try and, you know, prevent the pitchfork and mm -hmm. torches crowd at the gate. So yes, they knew, they understood that they were creating a wealth inequality. Their reaction to the next recession was the pandemic, was to print and borrow and mail out checks to such an obscene amount that they actually created all of this inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why when Chris Lingard says no one could see this coming, sure you could. You could if you just opened your eyes and took a look at it. You could see it coming. Um, and so I think that they understand that this inflation problem is now the next big thing that they're going to have to tackle. And it's not surprisingly that the way that they're going to go about doing it is, you know, all those rich people, the ones that want to buy the Tesla plaids, that's my theme for this podcast, <laughs> it, it, you know, we're going to stick it to them. We're not going to stick it to the poor people. We're not going to, we're not going to bail them out. Uh, we're going to actually unbail them out. We're going to make them poorer is, is and in order to, and in the process of doing that lower demand and hopefully bring down prices. Do you think they'll be successful? Do you think that we can muddle our way through this and and remain even the global reserve currency in like 10 years with everything that's happening in a geopolitical um, sense right now? Well, um, to answer the second question, uh, yes, we can remain the global reserve currency because there is no option. There is no other option. Uh, there is no other fiat option. The, the yuan, the euro, the yen, the British pound, 
None of them can do what the U.S. dollar does. None of them are big enough. None of them are transparent enough. Mm -hmm. um, none of them are established enough. The 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 one want they the, the Chinese want to be the reserve currency. They're not. No mm -hmm. one uses them outside of China. You know, outside of um, only Hong Kong uses them, and they had to forcibly take over Hong Kong to get them to use the one because it's not convertible and it's very opaque. Now, what could replace the dollar, I've always argued, is going to be a, a digital currency, a crypto, not a CBDC. A CBDC is just another version of the same right. thing. Right. But it would be some kind of crypto. Well, Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of the other ones, they're not ready or, or, or close to being reserve currency status. Can they be there in a decade? Uh, I Maybe, but I don't think so. So I think we are stuck with the dollar until proven otherwise. Well, I want to turn to Bitcoin for just a few of our last questions. Um, first of all, when did you first uh, hear about Bitcoin? Um, how far down the rabbit hole have you gone? How much are you kind of, um, I guess, you know, how would you say your knowledge is of about Bitcoin versus the other cryptos? And uh, at one point, I think you had laser eyes, but you took them down. No. Yes. 2015, I became aware of Bitcoin. 2017 is when I started buying my first cryptos. Um, going down the rabbit hole, I've done just about everything you could do in crypto land. I have lent, I have staked, I have validated. Um, you know, I've traded countless number of, of cryptos on different schemes. I hodl some. Um, I've, I've traded out of others uh, as well. Uh, I've got so many stupid wallets all over the place that I forget sometimes where all the where all of them are. Uh, finally, I finally organized that uh, this year oh, um, gosh. as well. You know, in, that, I, in other words, I really moved off the centralized exchanges in, into DeFi land. I have been a big fan of what they're trying to do. I do think it is build the building blocks of the next financial system um, as well. Uh, as far as the laser eyes goes. Um, here's the, the bottom line was I, I, I finally also, I started exercising eating healthy. I've gotten myself back into shape. I've lost some weight and I got sick of looking at the fat picture of myself. And that's why I got rid of that picture. Yeah. I could put laser eyes in the new picture I put up there, but I'm, I guess I'm just too lazy to do it right now, okay. but I still have my dot ETH address up there. So I'm not giving up on cryptos by any stretch of the imagination. Just out of curiosity, because one of the reasons why, um, you know, we are really big proponents of Bitcoin, myself, the people I interview, and a lot of people who listen to the show, is just this idea that we could finally decouple um, money from the government, money from the state. And the aspect of decentralization is so important so that no one can have this monopoly on on money and the, and the power that comes with it the way that it has and, and how it corrupts society. So I'm um, just, just out of curiosity, since you did, you know, mention ETH and a lot of us are very, you know, opposed to Ethereum because of its centralization issues. How do you measure decentralization? It's on a spectrum. It's not on a, um, it's on a spectrum and it's not a, a binary thing. You are decentralized or you're not decentralized. Um, so when it comes to decentralization, let me just say, I am with you. I am a decentralization maxi. And that I think that if you don't have decentralization, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. um, at the end, you've just created TradFi. You, you've created a CBDC is what you wind up, uh, a central bank digital currency. The whole reason we run these things on blockchains with, with uh, you know, uh, validators or miners is in order to be decentralized. It's hard and it's it's complicated. It would be much easier to just run it on a centralized server mm -hmm. and maybe even have the Federal Reserve run the centralized ser server for us as well too. And it would be cheaper. You, it would be cheaper and you you would, you know and the transactions per second would be much much higher and you've accomplished nothing. You've accom yep. you've just recreated the current system. Yeah. Now where I have where I've diverged a bit about with the maxi crowd, the, the Bitcoin maxi crowd is I've also said, it's not enough just to have a decentralized currency on censorship proof currency in Bitcoin. You need an ecosystem around it. And that's what DeFi has attempted to be is that ecosystem. That's why I've just, I focused on DeFi. I know that there's some uh, movement about trying to create a DeFi system on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, as well, maybe that you know will 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 yield some some efforts. I know there's the Lightning Network, 
but it's not really gotten big adoption yet. And that, that could p- potentially be another source of uh, decentralization. But if I have Bitcoin in a decentralized wallet, I need a decentralized way to exchange it, a decentralized exchange or a DEX would be nice. I need a decentralized way to exchange it with other people. Uh, the, the Lightning Network can help. And I need to do it so that it is outside the realms of being permissioned or censored. Mm-hmm. I think you need more than just the currency. You need an entire financial system around that. And the ETH DeFi system is a lot closer to it. The arguments about is ETH fully decentralized? Could it be more decentralized? Sure. You know, decentralization is a spectrum. It's not an absolute. It's either is or isn't. There are other aspects of it that it could be decentralized. And yes, there is some arguments about whether or not all of the validators and the new proof of stake system are fully decentralized enough. And it is very concerning that over half of them in the new system are, you know, sanctioning um, tornado cash um, wallets that have tornado cash uh, um, in it or have been dusted by tornado cash. Now it's only half that are sanctioning them. So the other half won't. So if you had to do a transaction, you can get it done, but that is a big concern. And within the ETH community, that is something that needs to be addressed. And I do think that the nexus point of the discussion right now is this whole decentralization thing, especially with this DCCPA law that's coming up, the digital cryptocurrency bill that they're talking about that Sam Bankman-Fried wants, um, you know, that's been, um, he's the owner of FTX that's been uh, lobbying um, Washington about writing this bill. Um, there is a lot of the, the bill hasn't been written. We don't know what the final word is going to be, but there's been a lot of concern that this bill will effectively end DeFi. And I think that if it does, and all you have is this thing called Bitcoin that is de- that is permissionless and censorship proof, but I can't do a whole lot else with it. I have to eventually put it into a centralized exchange where the government could hammer me with permissions and censorship in order to create, to exchange it to fiat, because I have to live in a fiat world, it's not going to cut it. We need to have a a larger ecosystem around this whole thing. And that's where I think the debate is right now. So is any of this fixed? Ethereum is not as decentralized as Bitcoin. All right, that's good. But Ethereum has a much more decentralized ecosystem around it than Bitcoin. We got to kind of bring them all together and get both at the same time, decentralization and a decentralized ecosystem around it. Then we could have true decentralized money. And then we could really start talking about building the next financial system. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. You bring up some some points that definitely are are trying to be addressed by by Bitcoin, you know, developers and entrepreneurs, especially with the Lightning Network and with things like Tarot, so that you can put stable coins and um and even this idea of future, you know, um NFTs and things like that on the Bitcoin network, which is truly decentralized. And there are so many concerns with with proof of stake and its long-term future. You mentioned some of the validator issues. So I think the next couple of years are going to be really, really interesting. And I'm very bullish on on Bitcoin. Bitcoin. And I think just like Jeff Booth has written, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but, um, you know, with, with this idea of this trilemma of security, decentralization and scalability, I think Bitcoin's going to end up winning and all the rest further down the road eventually will go to zero or they'll have to be, you know, they'll have to go to centralized databases that are just cheaper to run because um, it doesn't make sense. And something centralized doesn't work in this idea of DeFi. So again, I think it's going to be really interesting um, just to start to, to, to wrap up, um, you know, the next couple of months, I think people are are very, very worried about how to invest, whether they should be in cash to deploy, you know, if there's some sort of like capitulation moment, um, uh, you know, this idea of, again, whether the Fed's going to pivot for the for the average person out there who's just trying to save, take care of their family, you know, maybe they're young, they're trying to plan for their their first house or some big purchase. What's your best advice when it comes to investing? Well, if they're young, yeah, you know, they should own some crypto. There's nothing wrong with owning that. There's, the, you know, <laughs> yeah, give give it a give it a give it a couple of years. And um, but like I agree with your previous remarks, though, it really is about decentralization because without that, you've got nothing. Mm-hmm. But as far as to the question about investing, um, you know, whether or not there's going to be a capitulation in the marketplace, um, 
look at what you've seen um, from the centralized exchanges in crypto land. Uh, prices peaked last year, $70,000 on uh, Bitcoin. It's down under 20. And the Coinbase's and the Gemini's and the FTX's of the world are saying that volume is down about 75% from where it was last year. And volatility in cryptos is lower than the stock market. The S&P yeah. actually has, maybe in the last couple of days, because in the last week or so, you've started to see some movement in the crypto land. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you've actually started to see, you know, if I was to just diverge off in the ETH land, you know, you started to see some of the DGEN started to move. I mean, Dogecoin over the weekend doubled, doubled in less than 24 hours. That was oh, Elon man. Twitter, yeah. Yeah, well, are we back to that now? Shit coins doubling in 12 hours. Are we back to that era again, <laughs> you know? Um, but the, the point about that is that's what a capitulation looks like. No volume, no volatility, no one cares. That's not where we're at with the stock market right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're not at no volume, no volatility, no one cares. We're at high volume, high volatility. Everybody says everybody else is bearish. That's not a capitulation. Um, it, it, you know, I've seen when people absolutely hate markets. Look, I lived it in the bond market for many years. You know, they laugh at you. Why are you in the bond market? What a waste of time that is um, and stuff. And, you know, just kind of like they're almost like the no coiners are laughing at uh, the crypto crowd too. Why are you wasting your time in that space? So we're not there yet. I think that over the next couple of years, the markets are the trad fine markets are going to be a struggle. They're going to be a struggle at the top end because of higher inflation and higher interest rates. It's going to depress these markets. Oh, sure, there'll be rallies and there'll be declines and rallies and declines um, along the way. But if you're saying, when are we going to get back to the markets going up 15% every year and, and interest rates going to zero and the Fed, well, that requires the Fed to drop rates to zero again and start printing money. That requires inflation to go away. And that requires inflation that would require a return of cheap air, cheap goods, cheap energy and um, cheap labor. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think that this is a, if you're young, I don't think this is a bad time to start thinking about that Every time the market takes a dive, buy a little bit, buy a little bit more, buy a little bit more. We'll check it in 20, 25 years and see how it looks. Um, you can say the same thing about crypto as well. If you're older, look, it's going to be a struggle because as I've often argued, a bear market is time. It's not price. Mm -hmm. In a bear market, if I was to say to you, if I was to say to somebody who's 30 years old, yeah, the market might struggle for 15 years. And then it might then start, you know, get the, you know, I'm talking about the trad fine markets. Mm -hmm. They might struggle for 15 years, kind of meander sideways. Look, they did that from 2007 to basically, um, I'm sorry, they did that from 1999 to basically about 2011 or so. They went 12 years sideways uh, as during that period. But if, if we're going to have another period like that where they go sideways and you just buy every time it takes a big hit and then eventually it comes out of that and you're 30 years old to 35 years old, that's, that's, that's fine. But if you're 65, You'd say, look, I don't have 15 years because in 15 years, I'm 80 and I don't have to wait. I don't right. want to wait until I'm 80 in order for the market to start to take off. That's mm -hmm. why I mean by a bear market is time. A bear market is not price. So the harder question is, what do you tell somebody who's 65 years old? Right. Um, you know, what do they do? They, you know, the 30 year old has still got 35 years till they get to 65. And in 35 years, you could make the case that if they keep buying every time the market takes a, a giant dive down, they'll be they'll be happy with where they are in 35 years. So, yeah, the older crowd's got a problem. But the younger crowd, you know, just understand this is the environment we're in and be a little bit more patient with it. And boy, does that advice sound very similar to what I'd say about cryptos as well, mm -hmm. too. Well, do you see um, Bitcoin kind of decoupling yet from risk assets? Or what do you think it'll take for Bitcoin to see a higher high than we saw last year? Is it not going to be until, I guess, the printer reinitiates? Well, it, it, yes. I have argued that the, um, it, it, the current setup in the market now, it needs the printer to reinitiate to get back to 70,000. And that's not good. I'd prefer it not to be. What I would like to see Bitcoin do or any crypto do, uh, whether it's stable coins in the Bitcoin network or, or whatever, is I'd like to see them develop an outside ecosystem, a use case, a real use case. Because right now, I mean, let me be honest with you. What is the use case for crypto? You buy them, they go up a lot, and then you convert them to TradFi and you buy a Lambo. Mm -hmm. 
That's basically what the, or a Tesla plaid to keep with what I've been talking about here. Uh, that is basically the, what you can do with them now. But if some of the developers and some of the thinking is we develop them as a payment system where it never leaves the system. You pay me in Bitcoin and then I turn around and use Bitcoin to pay somebody else. We're not there. We talk about that potentially being the case. Yeah, you got Bitcoin Beach and a couple of other places, but these are exceptions. These are not the rule. Then when you develop in, in its own use case, you could see the divert, you could see the the, the um, correlation go to zero. And that would be good because then when the correlation goes to zero, it doesn't need the printer mm -hmm. to make a new high. And so I really think that at this point, we definitely need, what can I do with it besides hodl it and watch it go up in price and then transfer it back to my Coinbase account and transfer it and then you know convert it back into a bunch of US dollars. Um, you know, so that's what we need as the next use case. You give me that, and then I give you no less lesser correlation with everything else. So maybe that's what's coming next. We'll see. Well, I do see your point because a lot of us who are in Bitcoin, we do hodl it and there is this push, you know, you guys, you have to use it, especially if you want to get other people more involved. Right. But we need work in that area because I just came from Europe and there were places where I tried to use my Bitcoin or I tried to use Lightning Network and there were either technical issues or places didn't accept it. So we really do need to grow in that area and acknowledge that we have a lot of room to grow and to uh, get adoption going. Um, but I am, again, I'm very bullish on it long run because this is going to take a while. And the adoption curve, luckily, the technology curve, it's faster than the internet. So that is really, really exciting. Um, any final then, take Yeah, just a, a quick follow-up to that. On the flip side, one of the other statistics I've thrown around a lot is if you look at the 11 sectors of the S&P 500, the worst performer, worst performing of the last 15 years has been the financial sector. Mm -hmm. And within the financial sector, the worst performer in that group, or maybe not the worst, but a below average performer has been the banking sector. Mm -hmm. In fact, a lot of the bank stock indexes are at the same level they were in 1998, 25 years ago, or 24 years ago. I think that that's a signal from the market that the current CFI system is broken and that it needs to be repaired or a new system, it, it, word, wrong word, it needs to be disrupted and that a disruption needs to come. Mm -hmm. What the market is not telling you is what the disruption will be, but it, but no one wants to bid up the prices of this stuff because they see it as ripe for disruption. Mm -hmm. So I would say to you that within the TradFi markets, they're telling you that mm -hmm. this current financial system, the current banking system, the current system that has got all of the censorship and the permissioning on right. it, is fundamentally not not working for for people and we need something else and i think that something else is bitcoin or crypto it was it's it's there but it's not ready for prime time yet it's moving in that direction but we're not quite there and so i think the next bull market will be i kind of dubbed it the adoption bull market you know mm -hmm. that people are going to say oh yeah buy bitcoin because in addition to holding it and watching it go up you mm -hmm. can do this with it other than just hold it and watch it go up. You can buy things with it without ever having to convert back to dollars. And the person that you're buying it with isn't going to immediately grab your Bitcoin and convert it to dollars. They're <laughs> going to hold it for Bitcoin to turn around and buy something else with it. Yeah. You know, and if we could ever get to that point, then you can really see it moon at that uh, from there. Yeah, I think we are going to get there. And it is interesting the, what you're saying, because going back to, you know, that idea of populism, we need a disruption because so many people have felt left behind, especially young people in the current system. That's why I think they pick up whatever meme coin, you know, a couple of pennies here and there because they think it's going to shoot up. And then you're right, they'll transfer it, hopefully into Bitcoin, but possibly into <laughs> fiat because they want... They want money. They need money. The right. current system is is failing them. So, all right, Jim, right. it's been so great to talk to you. Any final um, takeaways? We've got, we're going to, I'm going to publish this uh, tomorrow. So November 1st, we've got the Fed meeting, November 2nd. Any final takeaways um, about macro, Bitcoin, anything? Yeah. Um, I think if you listen to some of my comments in this interview, you, you think that, um, I don't think they're bearish. I think what we are is we're in a period like the 40s. We're in a period of change. That change could come from the markets, uh, you know, changing because of cheap goods, cheap energy, cheap labor. That change could come from the financial system moving to cryptos. That presents a lot of opportunity. The opportunity is not just buy the S&P 500 spider 
and wait for the Fed to print you to new riches or just, you know, uh, buy Bitcoin and just wait for it to go magically up. But if you start looking into it, there's going to be other opportunities within crypto land. There's going to be what we refer to in, in um, CFI land as alpha. Some stocks will go up. Other stocks will go down. I mean, to be more specific, some energy stocks will go up. Other energy stocks will go down. It's not just buy, buy the energy index anymore. That's the way markets used to work until about the 80s or 90s. And I stock think picking. Might, yeah. yeah, stock picking has been a dead art form for 20 years. I think it's going to come back. And I think it's analogous to, to the crypto land uh, as well, that this is not in a period of change and in a period of, um, um, of kind of, you know, disruption. It is very, you know, it is very harrowing at times. Look, you know, when Uber was first coming around and was really taking off and people were excited, you had taxi drivers that were turning over Uber cars and lighting them on fire. And you had mid co city councils trying to ban this thing left and right. And they were telling you that it was gloom and doom. And eventually we've worked our way through it. We found out, I think we're net better off than we were under the old regulated taxi system. Now that's a simple example. Airbnb might be another example that people are comfortable with about you know disrupting the hotel industry as well. But this is that was change, and that's the way change is. Change isn't. I made a shitload of money, and then we take a right turn, and I make another shitload of money. In the middle, it becomes a little bit messy, and that's okay. That's the way it always is. So this isn't necessarily a dark argument for what's coming. It is an argument for disruption, and change and disruption is never easy and in a straight line. And if you understand it, and there's going to be a thousand ways to do it, you can profit from it as well too. Well, I understand where you're coming from. It, it honestly just makes me think about, though, the fact that, you know, over the last several decades, we've become so financialized because our money can't just sit in the bank. It loses its purchasing power, right? Because it's not scarce. We have an abundance of money and, and we've had sort of this infinite money printer go burr and it's led to so much speculation. And that's what that's ultimately what I hear is, you know, with crypto, so much speculation. Now it's like people trying to pick the right stock because your money can't just sit in the bank and go up in value which was, you know, sort of the hope of, of Bitcoin changing that. But we're going to have a couple of crazy years ahead, I think. Um, Jim, thank you so much. I will link your 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 company and your, your work down below. Um, thank you. I hope you come back on the show. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you so much for checking out this show. Again, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any new content. And I love to hear your feedback. Leave a comment or send me an email at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Let me know what you think, if you have guest suggestions, and I'll see you next time.